I said the word evangelism, and how many of you already are like checked out? Let's just be as honest as possible. You're like, oh my gosh, a talk on evangelism. Because when I think of evangelism, the first thing I think of is Billy Graham, right? So a guy who's an expert in a stadium of people trying to convince people about Jesus. And that's amazing. Billy Graham was amazing. And um, I'm, I, in fact, I, I regularly listen to his sermons, and I, I just, I love the legacy that he has. I also think of circuit writers. If you've read The Great Kind of Awakening in America, um, Francis Asbury, Peter Cartwright, I've read their journals. These are men that lived in um, late, late 1700s and early 1800s bringing the gospel to America um, and the U.S. as a new country. And rode, oh, Fran, Francis Asbury rode 270,000 miles on horseback, um, preaching over 16,000 sermons in his lifetime, uh, setting up circuit riders. Um, just courageous men and women throughout history done that. When I think about evangelism, I think of how I came back to faith when I was 18 years old. This, this is what evangelism was for me. You grab your Bible, you go to a crowded place. Let's just say I happened to go to Huntington Beach Pier. I went there. And um, I tried to argue people into the kingdom of God. <laughs> I called it apologetics. They call it apologetics. And apologetics is great. I love apologetics. But what evangelism is there is you're just trying to, in a modern context, convince people about certain things about the Bible and about Jesus. And in my opening line, no joke, when I was a zealous 18-year-old was, if you were to get in your car and drive home and die tonight, where would you go, heaven or hell? That's literally the question. I asked people, and it was a confrontational approach, and I did this with my friends. I loved argument. That's evangelism for some of us. Um, in our culture, evangelism is seen as now as extremism. You see, we live in a culture that believes in tolerance and acceptance, and that's probably the highest virtue of our, of our society today. And, and the thing about tolerance and acceptance is it's really, it sounds really nice, but the moment you have a, a truth that um, contradicts someone else's truth personally is that that truth is seen as oppressive. And so someone that believes Jesus is the way, the only way, um, is seen as an extremist. And for you to share that belief publicly, you're an extremist. That's where this culture is going, just so you know. That's why we have laws, our laws are being passed. There's all sorts of things going on that, that will, will kind of push that that, that culture forward of extremism. Are you with me? So evangelism is this weird word that's convoluted. And this morning, my, my only task is just to invite you to um, kind of relearn evangelism. And I want to just paint a better picture. So my, my theme is a better way of evangelism. So that's kind of what I'll be doing, just uh, talking through this. And so I have three points I'm going to make. And for those of you that do take notes and think Darren doesn't have kind of structure to his sermons, I don't, you know, I like John better or I like <laughs> Bill or whatever. Here's, I, there's like a team John going on. Like, you know, people are all about John. And it's just like, what? One weekend, I come back. And I'm people, I just preached in the first service. And they're like, gosh, that... It's a good Sunday, but last week, wow, amazing. No, it was great. Just kidding. Okay, so um, here are my three points. Number one, today I'm going to talk to you about witness, temple, and mirrors. So note takers, you want to know that, write that down. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about the lover of ponies. Um, it's a guy named Lover of Ponies. So point number two, a story about a guy called Lover of Ponies. And then uh, point number three is what evangelism looks like in our life. Sound good? That's where we're going, so you can follow along in your Bible. So if you have a Bible, go to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to start with witness. And um, actually, there's a, I have a slide, don't I, Sarah? Um, yeah, so the word evangelist, um, where we get the word evangelism, uh, has to do with someone who brings good news. Um, where it's also where we get the word gospel. Gospel means good news. Euangelion is the, is the Greek word, and so evangelist or evangelism has something to do with somebody who's bringing good news. Does that make sense? So let's talk about that. So go to Acts chapter 1. The church begins in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus has been uh, resurrected. He's about to ascend into uh, heaven, and he tells his disciples, he kind of commissions them. He says in Acts 1, he says this. This is talking to his followers. You will receive power. This is verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
Let me read that one more time. There's a bit of distraction, um, or at least I was distracted. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this is the commission to the church. Um, for followers of Jesus, they are told that they will receive power to um, be through the, through the Holy Spirit. So God's going to fill you with his life and do something in you, transform you so that he can do something through you. And the purpose of being filled is to be witness, a witness of, of Jesus. And so the word witness is the Greek word for where we get the word martyr. It's martyria. So a martyr is somebody who dies for the faith, right? And so... Um, Somebody who's willing to die for the faith is also somebody who clearly lived for the faith as well. Would you agree? So when we talk about witnessing or witnesses, Jesus fills us with his presence, his Holy Spirit, to give us power to do what we can't do on our own strength so that we could be the kind of person that points people to the resurrection of Christ, the reality of who Jesus is. This is what witness means. Are you with me? That our purpose, so what's the calling, the purpose statement of the church and, and, and someone that follows Jesus? Well, it's to live a life that's filled with the Spirit and be, to be empowered to, to do the things that Jesus did and to become like him, to point people to the reality of Jesus. This is one way of looking at the word witness, just somebody who points people to Jesus. Um, and it, what he, he says then is, is, okay, and you will be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. In other words, the, the point is you'll be filled to represent me and point to the reality of who I am everywhere you go. Um, and, and this message is just going to go places. So it starts in Jerusalem, so your hometown, and then Judea and Samaria. And what I love about that is what we don't pick up on. It's not just saying, oh, like L.A. and Orange County. Judea and Samaria is like to the context in life that it wouldn't make sense for it to go to together. Like, this message is going places where the, the, like the, the boundaries of ethnicity, the boundaries of race, the boundaries of gender, the boundaries of any boundary that's created, um, this is just going to transcend those things. Like, so, like, it's gonna, the message is going to get to ISIS, terrorists, and Tea Party. Like, that, it's just, it, the blood's in the, it's just going to go everywhere. You with me? You, you guys get it? So, in other words, we're going places. Okay, so... That's this, this journey. But what I want to suggest, so that's witness, is that we, um, this is not a new commission. In fact, this is what God intended from the beginning. That God intended from the beginning for people to live in such a way that it would just point to who he really is. So if you have a Bible, I just want to show you something. Genesis 1. I want to just paint a picture for evangelism found in Genesis. So if you have a Bible, go to Genesis 1. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Genesis 1 is the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. So that's pretty cool. Um, let me just give you some context for Genesis. It's a poem. Genesis 1 is a poem. So um, for those of you that think that this is like a blueprint for proving how old the earth is, it's not, it's not designed to be that at all. It's written as a poem. It's written as a, uh, a way of, of communicating creation, the story of creation, um, as kind of an antithetical argument for other creation narratives. What do I mean by that? So this is challenging the worldview of its day. So other gr groups and civilizations like the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, they believed the Greeks later on, they believe that they, creation was a different story. We were created on accident by gods that were at war. or it was, There's all sorts of crazy stories of what, you know, how we got here. But what, what the author of Genesis does is he, you know, there, it was written probably during the time um, of the wilderness after the, the Israelites were freed from Egypt. Um, but it's kind of written as a counter narrative. And what, what's important is that we need to know that there are all sorts of narratives that we live in right now, our culture tells us, and we have a counter-narrative. Does that make sense? So here's a counter-narrative, and what, why is it important? Well, the important thing is that God created us on purpose. So that's one thing. But let's just read this story, and I want to pull some things out that sh and show you where this idea of spreading the life of God everywhere else comes from. So Genesis 1, verse 26. Real quick, though, Genesis 1 is kind of this build-up of God creating. He starts with the heavens and the earth. It was formless and void. God creates um, the heavens and the earth, light, sky. He creates light and darkness. 
He creates the, uh, the sky and the earth and the stars or something, the night and day. He creates, let's see what else happens. Uh, he creates the, the land and the sea. So he, he constructs this new creation. And then the second part of the poem is he, God fills this creation. So he fills it with, with birds and fish and, he, and animals and vegetation and livestock. And then, he, and then we get to kind of the, the climax of the poem. The epicenter of this poem is verse 26. God said, let us make mankind in our image. Circle the word image or highlight it um, with your finger. In our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over livestock and all the wild animals. Stay with me for a second. And all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, there it is again, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So image is, is already communicated three times in two verses. So it's important. It's like uh, the Hebrew equivalent of like emojis. So that's literally like you say it three times. True. Um, God bless them. And listen to what he says. He says, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Subdue it is to rule over it or take over, um, steward it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So we start in Genesis 1. And God constructs creation, and then he fills creation. Now stay with me. And the last thing he does is he, he uh, creates humanity, and it says in his own image. The word image is temple language. In fact, this whole poem is, is, has temple theology all over it. And what do I mean by temple? Well, if you were in the business of other god worship, deities, idol worship in the ancient Near East, you would, um, you would build temples to these various deities. And what you do to build a temple for the deity is you construct a building first. So you build the temple for the God that you worship, and then you fill it with all sorts of artifacts, so precious stone, gold, metals, um, statues. And what you would fill it with are things that would reflect the deity that you worship. worship. So everything had, had purpose and meaning for the temple to be filled. And the last thing that someone would put into a temple for worship, and remember, temple is a phys physical space that a deity dwells. You with me? This is the, the, the thought behind a temple. The last thing you would put in is the image of that deity. It's the last thing. And then it was consecrated, and that became a place of worship for people. And the image um, represented that deity in that physical location on earth. That image was a, a source of the heaven and earth coming together. It was a place where the power of that deity was released in worship at that physical place. Are you with me? Are you, are you sure? Okay, so, so check this out. In Genesis 1, what is the temple of God? The earth. All of earth, all of the earth is the temple of God. It's where God's presence dwells. All, you see the spirit, Genesis 1, hovers over creation, right? He's in, so all of creation is God's temple. And the last thing that goes in is the image, you're right, is the image of God. And the image is designed to represent God on earth. And what? To fill the earth, to bring that God, to represent him everywhere we go. So humanity's commission as image bearers, is the phrase, is to bring God's way of life on earth. That's what an image did. It evoked the power and presence of that deity. And so our God's temple is everything, and the image of God is humanity, and our commission is to represent him everywhere we go. Are you with me? So when Jesus says, be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, he's fulfilling Genesis 1. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? We were designed to live in perfect relationship. That's the only way we can reflect God's image is in perfect relationship with God. Are you with me? We, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like a mirror. So an image of a deity would be like a mirror. Oh, look at that. So, um, so imagine this. So <clears throat> you are an image of God, created in his image, and you were designed to ref be positioned in such a way that it reflects God. We'll put him in this place up here to the world. It reflects God into the world. So when you are living in right relationship with God, that's this position. 
you reflect this kind of cosmic, this relationship with the creator God to the rest of the world. You represent him. You re you're pointing people to this God through your life and you're directing people towards God. Are you with me? Does that make sense? So what happens when sin enters into the world is you do this. Some of us find our meaning, our purpose, our identity from other people, from other things. And so out of this broken relationship, we reflect back to the world what we see. Are you with me? Or this way. This is probably more accurate for most of us. This is the way we see the world. We, we don't position the person of who we are from receiving our identity from God. We position it towards ourselves. And when you reflect back to the world, the brokenness and death and sin, what is consistent in that flow of life? Death, brokenness, and sin. But when, through Jesus, we are positioned back... Are you working with this image with me? I'm just playing around with this idea. But when you're repositioned to reflect God's life back into the world, you bring life everywhere you go as a mirror. So many of us, we're focused on ourselves, and that's just going to perpetuate the cycle of brokenness, death, and sin. Or out, outwards, we're trying to receive all this stuff from other people, but it's just reflecting back into the world, brokenness, death, and sin. But when we come into right relationship with God, He restores our relationship so that, not just for this beautiful gift of right relationship with God, but that we could become His image to the rest of the world. So as a mirror that's positioned properly reflects light, we get to reflect that life to God. This is what we're commissioned with. Are you with me? And I think this is what evangelism is really about. Just being human. Evangelism is simply being who we were created to be in the first place. When you experience this amazing relationship with God, but you direct that life towards others, people can't help but experience good news when you're around. Are you with me? Do you know, these are the kinds of people in your life that are contagious. contagious. It's like... Um, so many of us, evangelism is about trying to get people from here to there rather than live in such a way that the there is present. Amen. Like we talk about being full of joy and peace, yet we're depressed and just full of anxiety and fear. Not that that goes away, but that God can bring life to your life so that you become a conduit for peace and joy and hope. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think this is the, the way to, towards evangelism. It's like... I was at the gym a few months ago, and it was early morning, and I did not have any motivation, and I was like on the treadmill. And I remember I was just like walking like this on the treadmill, thinking, okay, at least I'm here, right? That's half the battle. It's like 70% of my workout. I showed up, okay? Um, but there was this lady, and she had music on, and she was riding the bike really fast, and she was getting into it. She was just like dancing, and like, but like, it was so contagious. I was like, I need a different playlist type of thing. Like, Whatever I'm listening to, right, there was like Bon Iver or something, and I was just like, you know, like walking. But she was like dancing, and I was like, that's it. And I think that's what evangelism really is, right? Rather than trying to explain what music sounds like, help people hear the music. Be, be overflowed with that music. Turn up the music of Jesus in your life and let it come oozing out so that they change the station, so that they can have what you have. I want to smoke what he's smoking, in other words, or whatever it is. Like, <laughs> that's a horrible reference, but it makes sense. <laughs> Evangelism, smoke what he's smoking. Pastor told me <laughs> to do this. So the good news that we're talking about is that God is is now in charge through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And he's, he's putting the world back to its proper place. And he's putting you and I back to the way we were intended to be in the first place. And the life he promised, the life of wholeness and shalom and peace and justice and beauty and goodness and, and forgiveness and, and grace and meaningful relationships, that's available here and now. Doesn't that sound like what our world needs more than ever before? What Jesus is doing is he's bringing new creation to earth through us. And what he's working on is a place called earth that in Revelation 21 and 22 will be restored once and for all. It's not destroyed. It's restored. And heaven comes here. And look at what heaven looks like in Revelation 21 and 22. It looks like the temple. 
It's, it's amazing. The temple is so important. But we're restored and the presence of God is everywhere. God's restoring everything. And, and when I see the world and I just gone for a week and it's like more death, more racism, more teenagers shooting six-year-old kids, suicide, pain, refugee crisis is the, one of the worst in history. And you see all those things and you say, well, God is working towards the reconciliation of all things. Those places of pain is where Jesus wants to send his body to and make a difference. That's a form of evangelism. It's just a bringer of good news. And sometimes it's a cup of coffee. Sometimes it's a gift of generosity. Sometimes it's an articulated word of truth to somebody's lie. Sometimes it's the purity that has been cultivated over a lifetime in the presence of impurity that is evangelism because it's contagious because all you're doing is showing people it's him. Are you with me? Okay, I'm preaching over here. Um, Acts. So, witness, temple, Mirrors, evangelism. We're just painting a better picture. Uh, go to Acts 6. I just want to tell you a story about a guy named Lover of Ponies. Are you with me? Acts 6. I'm just going to read it and I'll tell you what's going on. It's, this story is so important because I, I want to show you how, um, how significant evangelism is and I want to just dispel all the reasons we, we kind of don't talk about our faith. We don't show it. We're not interested in bringing our friends. If your friends are living without Jesus, they're not living with their full capacity for human existence. Do we care? Some, I mean, I, I, I'm just, I, we, get, we'll get, we get distracted. I'll tell you about that. Let's go, Acts 6, we're at 1. I'm super jet lagged. Are, are you guys following me? I don't, I'm kind of missing. I like, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm, I'm tracking with you. Just give me some couple of feedback. This section, just like, okay. All right. This guy's? Yeah, okay, I'll just take it. So we're all right. Here we go. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the church exploded, Acts 1. You're going to be my witnesses through the Spirit. Acts 2, the Spirit comes. They preach. They begin to do the things that Jesus said they would do, healing. Um, they begin to preach the gospel. The first Sunday morning, the church is over 3,000 people. 3,000 people were baptized in Acts chapter 2. The first church was always expansive and growing and multiplying. Why are we planting? We have so much room in here for more people. Why are we starting a third service? Because we want to reach a different demographic and a different community. We want to keep expanding and multiplying. Not for numbers, but because God is concerned for, about the lost. He loves them. And the church exists. Our community exists for the people that aren't here. So the church is expanding, and we have Hellenistic Jews. So Jews that, uh, excuse me, Hellenistic Jews. So Hellenized were, was Greek-speaking, Greek culture, widows, and Hebraic. So you have Jewish-speaking, Jewish culture. Totally different thing, okay? And they're coming, they're complaining. The word is grumbling or gossip. They're literally complaining about each other. In the church, that's just totally not appropriate. And so we see that it's diverse, it's large, and there's this really good thing where the widows get food every day. How amazing is that? That the first church decided, hey, those that don't have enough, we're going to make sure that you have enough. And so there was a daily distribution. So, but it caused a problem. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So administrative task is overwhelming the church because as it grows, administration also grows. And I think, this side note, that churches that grow large, um, know how to uh, receive and practice the gift of administration. I think you see this across the board because it's not about programming and strategy and structure, although that's part of it. Um, but what we see here is there's this, this idea of empowering and releasing other servants into ministry. You with me? And we can, we can remain small, holy huddle, or we can just keep releasing it and giving it away. And so they get strategic, and this is what happens. It says, uh, brothers and sisters, um, Choose seven men from among you who are full of the spirit and wisdom and we'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So this is what I, I see it as. They, this is what the enemy will do to you. This is why we probably miss opportunities to bring life to the city. It's because if the enemy can't shut you up through sin, can't corrupt you with hypocrisy, he can't overwhelm you with 
fear of persecution, opposition, um, or intimidation, then the enemy will give you more and more opportunities that are really, really good. But they are the things that Jesus is not asking you to do. You, in other words, they get distracted by good things. So this was a, a, a test. The apostles were called, they had the role in the church to preach and teach. That was a role that was set apart uh, for certain people to equip the rest of the ministers for ministry. But when the church was filled with this need, rather than it being just on the 12, they said, we need to empower this church to, to care for itself. And the way we're going to do that is not by selecting those that have a passion and calling for administration, but by selecting those with hearts of service. Are you with me? Um, the, the qualification to pass out food to widows was not how good you made a casserole or how great you are at Excel or if you did this in your previous life. It was a heart for Jesus' bride and his mission. And so they select seven guys, and this is what it says, um, and they would focus on prayer and ministry. And the proposal pleased the whole group, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Tim, um, Timon, Herminius and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And look at what happens. So as the church begins to serve, as it serves within the community, as people step up and say, no, I'll, I'll, I'll pass out food, you guys do that, and I'll do this, and you, I'll carry this part, and you carry that part, and I'll carry the It becomes the church. It, it is the body. As um, administrative tasks and responsibility are taken on, there's an evangelistic outcome. Look at what it says. It says um, that, it says somewhere in this Bible, so the word of God spread. The word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So when we talk about evangelism, we're talking about living a life that's pointing people to Jesus, but we're also talking about the church being the church, that there's a place to serve because when we serve here, when we participate in the life of the community, um, we empower people outside of the church to come in. Are you with me? Yeah. Um, but the point of this is really to tell you the story of Philip. Check out the name. So there's these seven guys, and we don't know anything about them. They're, we don't know how, how educated they were. We don't know how long they were a Christian. We don't know how old they are or young they are. We don't know anything about them other than they were selected because of their, um, they were full of spirit and wisdom. And this, so here's Stephen. This is a great name. I just want you to picture they, they find these seven guys, and they're lined up. Stephen, crown victorious. Prochorus, leader of the dance. And I've already identified myself as that guy. So... Um, <laughs> I'm leader of the dance. Nick, Nick Nor, victorious army, right? Timon, he who respects or, or gets respected. Perminius, it's permanent. Like, talk about stable presence, permanent. And Nick, Nicholas, people's victory. Could you just see? And then you have Peter, you know, the rock. And then you have, have Barnabas, son of encouragement. And then you get Philip, lover of ponies. Hi, guys. It's like, <laughs> hey. It's me over here. It's like, like, just imagine. No, you don't know anything at all except their names. And these are all Greek names, which is interesting because the Hellenized ones were complaining about the Hebrews. So they selected um, the Hellenized names, which is, which is fascinating. So that's all we know. That's all we know. Evangelistic outcome. So Philip is serving the church, the lover of ponies, serving the church. And he's, he's, he's filled with, with the task. He's, he's, he's got to pass out food to widows. Do you think that Philip studied for that? I just, oh, do you think that's fulfilling his passion in life? Do you think that that's the thing he was made to do? Or do you think that's the thing that Jesus was doing in the moment? And he just said yes. Because I think the problem with the millennial generation is we make everything, uh, the me, my, my dreams, my ideas, my, my, my security, my comfort, my career, that's, that's what God is all about, Right? And that's, that's a lie. That's idolatry. You are not the center of the world. Jesus is in his church. And so I, I, that's sorry to call us out. I'm just repenting publicly to you because that's what I do, right? I just, it's, it's my ministry. I hear people say, and no, one, no one here, of course, but some, some of you said, that's not my ministry. Um, I have another. Like people will say, like, my ministry. Um, and that really troubles me because the word ministry means service, and it's all Jesus' ministry anyways. <laughs> and so if he happens to invite you into his ministry, it's his, and you're serving. Does that make sense? 
You see like the oxymoron, moronic statement to say my ministry. It's, it's like, it's not your ministry. When pastors say I have my ministry, it's not your ministry. It's Jesus's ministry. And everything you should be doing is pointing people to that reality in your lifestyle, in your attitude, in your schedule, in your finances. And that's it. Okay, I'm preaching to myself there. Thank you for that. So, um, so here's Philip. And he's just, he, he is a regular dude. We don't know anything. He's literally trained to pass out food to widows. And look at what it says in verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 1. I just want to tell you a quick story of what happens with this lover of ponies. So on, there's a persecution that breaks out. Verse 1 of chapter 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So just pause there. Persecution that comes, and all the leaders stay in the main area. And everyone else is scattered. Everyone else is scattered. And then we pick up verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Lover of ponies went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowd heard Philip and saw the signs being performed by this widow associate, this, this, this potluck associate, <laughs> they all paid close attention to what he said. And for, for with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed so that there was great joy in the city. Do you see how significant this is? He's unqualified. He has no training. He's not the leader. Do you think he was preoccupied with the fact that he wasn't trained? that he didn't take the evangelistic course, that he wasn't educated, that he didn't get a paycheck from the church? Do you think that he was insecure, that he wasn't a good preacher because Peter was the preacher and John, well, he was the beloved? Do you think he was dealing with all sorts of fear and insecurity? Do you think he was afraid that he might die? Was he preoccupied with his strength finders test that showed him as being really good at administration? So why would he go to Samaria of all places and begin to do something that he wasn't good at or known for? That's not what's going on. This is simply, it's so simple, guys. It's so simple. All he did was what Jesus would do if Jesus walked into the city. That's it. What did Jesus do? Cast out demons, heal the sick, preach the good news. What happens when good news goes to cities? People are full of joy. How many of you have neighbors that are full of despair, friends that are struggling? How many of you are in a place of despair? So how many of you need the good news this morning? This is what it's about. All Philip does without the resume is what Jesus would do. He's just not distracted by all the other things. He's not distracted by our preoccupation of what other people think, of what we look like, of whether or not we'll come off cool or right or we'll say the right thing if we'll have the right word or you know, whether we've been educated for it or we're too young or too old or we don't want to get kicked out of the group. I don't want to seem that particular way. Preoccupy with our comfort and security and safety so that we build these, these, literally these mansions of lives that are built around our routine, uh, built around our identity, built around the things that make us feel good about ourselves, built around checking out and entertainment. Again, I'm just speaking about my own life here. Rather than an openness, God, what are you doing here? What are you doing in my workplace this morning? Can I come prepared to come and bring the life that you want to extend this morning to this place? Rather than being open and available. And look at what happens. So this is, this is why I love this story. So Philip's just an ordinary dude doing ordinary things for Jesus. And that's extraordinary. Ordinary dude, ordinary things become extraordinary when they're done for Jesus in obedience And it goes on. Here's the story. Let's just read this. Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to lover of ponies, I just want to make sure that we're reading the same gospel, uh, or Acts, go to to the road, that desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So just here it is. There's literally a party. He's at a party in the city of Samaria. There's so much joy. He's the guy. He's the one that brought the good news. People are casting out, he's casting out demons. He's healing the sick. He's, he's doing it. He's got a city revival going on and they have to call in the reinforcements from Jerusalem. The apostles come in. And so there's a party going on and listen to what happens. God says to him, hey, I know you're at this party, but go to the desert. 
So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. That's really important. So he's coming back from Jerusalem, going back to Ethiopia. And on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told lover of ponies, hey, go, go over to that chariot and stay near. So he leaves the party. He goes to the desert. He's walking. He meets this, this Ethiopian eunuch. And then he, God just says to him, hey, go stand by there. So he walks over there. And he's just walking down the desert road. And then he ran, ran up to the chariot. And he heard the guy reading out loud. And he says, do you understand what you are reading? And the guy says, how can I know unless someone explains it? So he, he invites him to sit with him. And then he, the passage he was reading was, was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, as so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who could speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from him, from the earth. Okay, so that's like a God moment, right? <laughs> it's the passage. It's about Jesus. So it says, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, how awesome is this? Who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And then Philip took a deep breath and began with that very passage of scripture and told them the good news about Jesus. And as they were traveling along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's some water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gets in the water and gets baptized. Guys, do you want to know why this is so significant? The Ethiopian eunuch was a, Jew, was a convert to Judaism, and he had traveled from modern-day Sudan to Jerusalem, a few hundred, if not a thousand miles, in the desert in the ancient Near East 2,000 years ago, to go to the center of, of his, uh, his faith. And he, when he gets to the center of faith after that travel, after that long of travel, that's the only place that you can worship God fully. He, as he gets there, he wants to go to the temple, which is the center of worship in the center of Jerusalem, which is the center of this, the, the country, for the center of his religion. And at the center is the Holy of Holies and at the temple. And at the Holy of Holy, Holies, around that is the court of the priests. And around the court of the priests is the court of Israel. And around the court of Israel is the court of women. And around the court of women is the court of the Gentiles. He couldn't even get to the center of the worship. What can stand in the way of this new faith? Nothing. Nothing I can do on earth will keep me from Jesus' love. Let's get baptized, he says. And without missing a beat, they jump in the water. He gets baptized. He's filled with joy. And, and Philip, lover of pony, ponies, is on his way to another place. Do you see how significant this is? This Ethiopian eunuch receives the good news. And then it says he's rejoicing back home. Ethiopia has one of the oldest churches known to man. Yes. Ethiopia is modern-day Sudan. In Roman context, 2,000 years ago, its nickname was the ends of the earth. Ordinary guy, ordinary things, listening to Jesus in everyday moments, everywhere he went, to everyone he met. What does evangelism look like? Well, I don't know about you, but I have plenty of reasons why I shouldn't share my faith, I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't post that, I shouldn't talk. I don't feel good enough. I don't think I'm smart enough. I, I really believe I don't think I'm smart enough in general. That's a lie I live in regularly. I'm not, I'm not old enough. What, there's so many. I'm preoccupied. I'm on my phone 24-7, let alone walking into places thinking that I'm going to be a, a person of presence here that reflects as a mirror reflects the image of God to everyone else to show them who they really were designed to be. That's not my normal MO. I'm preoccupied. I'm distracted. I have all these reasons. We have all these reasons, but God is just saying, I want to fill you with my Holy Spirit so that you can do what you were created to do. Be my image. Be my witness. On earth, as in heaven, everywhere you go, to everyone you meet, every day you live, and bring life, true life. That's what evangelism is all about. Brothers and sisters, evangelism is not a special gift. It's what it means to be Christian. It's just doing what Jesus would do. So ask yourself, what would Jesus do? It's like a great idea. We should like brand that. Like <laughs> WWJD. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> okay, so last thing. How do you work this out in your life? So I want to give you some ideas. Okay, so I, I, you got all that stuff. Lever of ponies, that's pretty funny, right? <clears throat> I think it's funny. Um, How do we become, how do we allow evangelism to flow out of our life? Number one, turn the music up in your life. Don't be someone that's just trying to convince people that there's a song playing. 
Help them hear the music. Show people how to hear it. Show them how to listen. Turn it up in your life. Spend time with Jesus. Invite him into the places of your life you need him. Just become a person that's contagious. You can be an introvert and still be an evangelist. In fact, I have a friend who's an evangelist in Northern Ireland. And he's seen thousands of people come to know the Lord, and he's the most introverted person I've ever met. It's because he's listening to God. Second, <clears throat> hear and obey. It's that, if there's anything I want to teach you for the rest of your life at the Garden Church, it's to listen to God's voice in your life and obey it. That will take you on the most incredible adventure, I promise. And sometimes it looks like simple things that might be hard for you, like generosity in the moment. Like, uh, I I'd rarely carry, ca carry cash because when I carry cash, I give it away. This is true. Um, in the UK, I, in London, I was literally giving away everything, and Alex was like, you've got to save it. We need it for taxi rides back and blah, blah, blah. But, um, and that's okay. Not, not, it's just my thing. And, but I'm also testing on it on a this certain dollar amount. So Saturday before we left, I went to... Oh. I went, to, um, uh, I, basically, I went to a restaurant to get lunch for us before we left, and, and I was coming back home. But on our way, I, I walk into the restaurant, and someone's asking for money. And I, have, I just pulled out cash for the trip, and I have a $20 with me. The rest is in the car, and a $20 bill. And the first thing that comes to my mind is I was hiding it, is that, oh, I don't have any money, right? But I didn't say that. Um, but the second thing, as I was listening to him share what, what's going on in his life, was, oh, I should go break this and then bring him some. And then as soon as I, I literally was like thinking of this as he's talking, God says, God literally spoke to me and said, how much have I given you? And I was like, oh, ew. he's like, like basically like, crap. <laughs> but that's a polite thing I said in my head. So I was like, dang it, I'm condemned. So I gave him the 20 reluctantly, which is not saying anything because I did it grudgingly. And, um, and then he goes, as I give it to him, he says, you're Darren from the garden. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. You're welcome. And, and then he's, he went on to tell me a story how he came here once and came to a potluck, no joke. And, and then I was able to pray with him and invite him to come back. And, um, but it's like those moments, right? Just be generous. I think some of us can be evangelistic by tipping way more than we should. Seriously, I think that there might be a movement. A tip 30% and see what happens. Uh, other ways is like praying for people. So I, my wife is getting tired of this, but I keep praying for, for people that are limping or in pain or in casts just because I feel like the Lord's saying, I want you to risk. Um, and you're not going to see it until you keep risking. I mean, literally no one's getting healed. They're, like I prayed for this guy's eye. And I, he, he's like, I think my right eye is starting to hurt. And so I'm like, <laughs> all right, I'm done. So, but... <laughs> I did pray for a guy with a heel. He was limping with it. I shared this story. And I was walking to lunch with another guy. And he was pushing this cart. And he was limping. And he told me a story. He had cancer as a kid. He cut part of his heel off. And it always grows back something. And he has to get it removed every few months. And it's extremely painful. He's had it since he was nine. He was in his 50s. I said, let me pray. Pray. The pain goes away after the second prayer. He's freaking out. He's like, uh, he's like running up and down doing jumping jacks, jumping. He's like hugging me, saying, you have magical powers. And I'm like, I don't have any power, but Jesus does. And he just did this for you. What do you want to do? And he gave his life to Jesus. And like that, so sometimes it, it, like that happens. Most of the time, it's just a hug and saying, oh, God bless you, see you on your way. But step out in prayer. Sometimes it's a text message. I was, I, I'm just telling you my stories that have actually worked. I've done hundreds of these and it doesn't work. But I was literally like randomly walking in, down the street, and I thought of this guy who I met a long time ago, and I had this thought about his wife dealing with anxiety. So I said, hey, this is so strange. I texted him this long thing. Is she dealing with anxiety? Can I pray? Is that it? Blah, blah, blah. Long text message. He, sent, he calls me back, freaking out. How did you know? And again, I don't know. I think God just wants to love, and you pray for him. See, I think this is, the, this is the way, and this is God's strategy. To make, and I'm not the perfect example. Guys, I blow it. I'm, I, let me just, I sin regularly. I lose my temper. I'm, I'm at, most of all, I'm a bad husband. I blow all the time. I, 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 I'm blowing. I'm regularly repenting. You need to know this, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect. I, I regularly struggle with insecurity, fear. I care massively about what you think. I judge myself by what others say about me. I find my identity in what other people think. I have a massive father wound. You got it? Yeah. Okay. With that, this is God's strategy just to get people to listen to him and obey. And one out of 100 is enough. Imagine if that one person that comes to church, that one person you invited out for that time, you sent that text, you prayed, they got healed. Whatever the outcome, God, the strategy is he wants to bring his way of life to, the, to everywhere on earth through you. No matter if you just came in here and you've never said yes to Jesus, today he wants to use you to bring life. 
No matter if last night you, were, you, you got drunk and you're hungover right now and you um, are coming off of down from a high, he wants to use you right now because nothing can stand in the way except you. So get out of the way. Filtering a song, I know, so get out the way. <laughs> Should we pray? Yeah, we definitely need to pray. Can we stand up together? Let's pray.